Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Three navy blue linked ovals form capital letters V and A within a bright yellow rectangle. I have the pleasure of introducing you to the main event, which are these wonderful people sitting off to my right, your left, the panel. And we have four people who have joined us on the panel today. I'm just going to quickly introduce them and then I'm going to let them respond to questions. I'd like to introduce you first to the only lady on the panel, the only woman on this particular panel. There's lots of others out and about, but this is Nikki Hind. She is the founder of the Australian fashion label Blind Grit. She hails to us from Aubrey and is going to share with you about how she became a fashion designer. At the far end of the table, furthest from me and next to Nikki, is Cameron. Cameron Rolls is a senior lecturer at ANU, the Australian National University College of Law in Canberra. On Nikki's left, is Ian Edwards, who is the director of Blind Chef and is himself a chef who has been working for many years in the restaurant business cooking and making things happen on that front. And he hails to us from Newcastle on the Central Coast. And then immediately to my right is um, my friend and colleague, Andrew Moffat, who is a mediator law lecturer at University of Melbourne and former senior financier in the UK and Australian financial sectors, but I think of his financial times as being mostly in the UK, probably erroneously since I'm now reading this piece of paper. So I'm going to start us off and I'd like to ask Nikki to take the mic from me. We're doing the ladies first thing. It's a very traditional kind of thing. I'll pass the phone down, uh, the phone, the microphone to Nikki and ask you to please tell us about your adventures. And then if you wouldn't mind passing the phone to Cameron and we'll work our way back up the line. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? My name's Nikki. I'm apparently Australia's first legally blind fashion designer. I'm the founder of Blind Grit, which is inspirational athleisure wear created by those who conquer challenges for those who are ready for one. So Blind Grid is built entirely of and around people with, who live with disability, not just vision impairment, disability in general. So all the cool, fun, creative, aspirational jobs that sit behind the uh, development of a fashion label, everything but the manufacturing really, uh, social media, the designing itself, photography, modelling, uh, hair and makeup design, um, uh, graphic design, all those things will be done by people who live with disability. Okay. Fantastic. Hi everybody, uh, my name's Cam Rolls and uh, as, um, as uh, Karen told you, I'm a senior lecturer at the ANU College of Law in Canberra. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to encourage you um, I really loved Karen's keynote and I loved a lot of the the points she made and I'd just like to encourage you, you might be sitting in the audience thinking, gosh, it's pretty daunting having a career now in in um, in you know the 21st century, but I'd like you to stop and think about it as as a challenge that you can embrace because I've always said that now is the best possible time to be blind, but I think I'm wrong. I think that as time goes by, it will keep being the best possible time to be blind. So I think that your opportunities are only going to get better and better and better and that your ability to embrace the changes that you need to embrace is, is going to consequently flow with that. So I'd really encourage you to embrace it. Don't be frightened of it. Dive in and love it because I think you're going to have a fantastic ride. So I'll... I'll um, tell you more when it's my turn on the panel, but I just wanted to give you those words of encouragement. Thank you. 
Hi, my name's Ian Edwards and I'm a, the director of The Blind Chef. Um, my story is similar, you know, I was a chef most of my life and it became necessary to start my own business due to my legal blindness and we, in, we uh, encourage our staff, most of our staff, excluding one who assumes he's normal, um, is, are all either disability or vision impaired. Um, you know, my story was when I first lost my sight, it was devastating enough. But as you spoke to younger people and you'd ask them what they were going to do when they left school, they'd say, oh, nobody will give me a job. So, you know, our complete staff is, you know, all vision impaired or disability. And, you know, and, and like uh, the other panellists have said, you know, don't be scared of it. But by the same token, don't sit back and, somebody, and think somebody will give it to you because you have to work for it and you have to kick a lot of doors in to get to where you need to be. But, you know, um, as they said, it's the right time in life to be blind because the opportunities now, even from two years ago when I became legally blind, um, it is a lot better and there's a lot more opportunity out there for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Andrew Moffat. I feel quite relieved when... Karen says we're supposed to have five careers because actually I'm on my fifth, so I can start putting my feet up. Um, so uh, as, um, as Karen said, my, I went to university in, in Melbourne, but um, my uh, opening job of my post-graduation career was in London, and I went, went to London for 15 years, and I was an investment banker. Um, uh, so that was career number one, came back after 15 years there and became a commercial banker. And if anyone cares, I can explain the difference between the two. That's quite profoundly different, um, different areas of enterprise. So career number two was as a commercial banker in Melbourne for, uh, for six years. Um, career uh, number three then um, was as a uh, director and now chair of an organisation called Vision Australia, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, in the interest of disclosure, Cam's also a director. Um, so that was career number three in, uh, in governance. Career number um, four started um, uh, fairly shortly after that by coincidence, which was leaving financial services and establishing a practice as a commercial mediator. Um, and that absolutely puts me in the gig economy, as Karen said. So um, I'm riding all the major fashion trends at the moment. I think I'm feeling pretty good about that. And then, and then the fifth one was becoming a law school academic, which was absolutely not expected, but I was uh, approached by the law school that I studied at, Melbourne University, to start teaching mediation w with um, which I practice. So actually careers uh, three, four and five are concurrent. Um, uh, two of them are kind of ongoing and one of them is very much in this gig space and, and I, I think that, that gives me some insights into the challenges. Certainly it's, I found it's helped me help my children who are between the ages of 20 and 22 kind of navigate the world that you're all entering and um, and, and in a sense I think it helps my children find that ambiguity um, less scary um, and in particular uh, at least um, at least two of the five careers didn't exist three years, four years before I started doing them. So the idea that not only will you have a number of careers, but a significant number of those careers don't currently exist, um, that too is something that you can, uh, with the right uh, skills and approach, regard as an opportunity rather than um, something that needs to be scary. I very much look forward to um, uh, weaving out some of those thoughts um, in response to the questions that I'm going to get bombarded with by all of you when we're in groups later. Thank you. Well, Andrew, before you put down that mic, now that I have one that works too, I'd like to follow up with a query about what you did when you were in school in terms of casual work. So I, I started, when I was a child, the first thing I could do, I mean, the first thing anyone was able to do, you weren't allowed to start working in shops till you were 15. I don't know what the rule are now. I imagine it's probably similar. So I used to deliver newspapers, four o'clock in the morning, um, delivering newspapers to people's houses. I don't think that's so much of a thing anymore, but um, but certainly, um, and I was lucky at that time, I lived in a country town. I lived in Bundaberg, so, you know, that was quite viable. Um, then I used to work in the supermarket, um, 
and, uh, and the big race then was to try and clock off as early as possible um, after I'd cleaned up my station in the supermarket because the supermarket um, bakery stuff was all for free to the staff and if you clocked off quickly you might be able to go home with a family size apple pie which my ch family would love. If I clocked off more slowly it was uh, pre-sliced rye bread which, um, which didn't get such a good reception. I then did a bit of um, bar work collecting glasses in the sailing club and then when I went to university, I, um, I got a job in uh, Dick Smith Electronics, electronic shop, which may at rest in peace, but um, my, um, my low vision made me singularly unsuited, uh, un, um, suited to doing some things. Uh, we used to sell lots of resistors, and if anyone uh, knows what a resistor is, it's got lots of little bands to tell you what precise value it is, and even with a magnifying glass I couldn't read them, but that made me very much engaging with the clients, so I, I empowered our customers to find their own resistors, and, um, and, and, and that was, um, I guess, along the lines of what Karen would regard as a, as a workaround, um, and, and after three years I had, by that point, a commerce degree, so, and then my last years was finishing my law degree, so I worked as an accountant um, for the last two years, and, uh, and all fun, and there's no question that there's a significant um, foundation of all of the stuff that I've done subsequently in every single one of those jobs. Ian, working as a chef, you're working around sharp things and hot things and under t incredible time pressures. Is it right to assume that vision impairment has made some tasks more challenging? And can you share with us how you've addressed those challenges? Uh, yes, um, the situation now is a bit different to what it was when I first became legally blind because that wasn't an issue. Um, but now, biggest thing for me is my deep fryer from hell. It, <laughs> the depth of the hot oil is the only thing I still have issues with. And I probably tip the hot oil and tip some of my fingers a couple of times a week. But you soon learn to pull back pretty quick. Um, but that's the, real, the only challenge that I, I, I find now that really gets me. Um, if I'm under pressure wise, my vision deteriorates badly. And I do then do a bit of yelling. Um, as my young cohort in the front seat there will vouch for. Um, but... Sharp things in that I've had like you know I've had 30 years experience of in a kitchen, so that was sort of the norm and I got used to it you know. So, but you know hot things in that are probably the testers these days that I just touch it and I think yep that's hot shouldn't touch that, um, or that you know but but you know you, you learn from it and you move on. I don't do it half as much as I used to two years ago when I started the the Blind Chef project. Uh, things have improved from that point, but um, yeah, it's it's still the only place I really want to be, and um, and it's been good since we started the project that we can continue to do it. So, yeah, Wonderful. thank you. Well, and I appreciate the fact that you mentioned that you had had some practice with those knives, and mm -hmm. I think that is a key element. It's yeah. helped you prepare well for what you're doing now, and to be able to do it well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Would you mind handing to Nikki? Nikki, would you talk to us for a few minutes about what you did to prepare? What kinds of programs and opportunities really enabled you to be successful? Absolutely. And before I talk about that, I'd just like to, uh, the entrepreneur, the social entrepreneur in me, says to all of you young ones out there that you've just heard from a vision impaired chef here that the 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 hardest thing for him is burning himself on hot oil. So all you awesome creative innovators in the audience, how, you create a solution for that. And uh, <laughs> then we can have some of the top chefs in the world being, being blind. They won't burn their fingers because one of you out there will have created some incredible thing that won't only help blind chefs from burning their fingers, but will probably... Um, well, it would help in all sorts of things, wouldn't it? Um, I, uh, I have done a degree and um, a postgrad in public relations, and I've also uh, done my fashion, my fashion design at TAFE. So I have, I've, you, you know, been in an academic uni situation, and I've been in that more hands-on, practical TAFE setting. 
absolutely loved both of them. They both have incredible strengths. Um, and on my journey as, I'll call myself an entrepreneur more than a, a fashion designer, um, I have connected with uh, the Disability Leadership Institute, who are incredible, and um, the, uh, I won a scholarship through the ING Dream Starter Scholarship, which was for social business. It was for the uh, social business model that I created for Blind Grit. And I'm also connected with Global Sisters. Uh, and now it's really interesting that the benefits I got from those three, um, those three different organisations because the, uh, the ING Dream Starter Scholarship is um, it's specifically set up for social business. So, and social business is all about, um, you know, empowering, in, empowering and social justice for, um, for people. And uh, the, but pretty much everybody who was starting a business, who who was uh, I was the only one with the scholarship. The rest uh, were paying uh, that. That um, there was not a single other disabled person in the room, and there were very few women compared to men. Um, yeah, so th there's um, there is quite the lack of people with disabilities um, as entrepreneurs, as business people starting their own businesses, and um, that, that goes. It, there's even more so female um, disabled entrepreneurs. Uh, to be in decision-making positions, um, well, it's a good way to be in a decision-making position, to create your own business. Um, yeah, and I think it's terribly important that more people with disability in Australia are in decision-making positions. But Disability Leadership Institute, that feels like my tribe, they are so very aware of the incredible leadership qualities that people who live with disability have. And Global Sisters is, um, is actually all about empowering women to start their own business, so that was different again. So all those three things together have been wonderful. So, t you know, t take, what you, take what you want and take what you need, take a, you know, look at the things that you, that you want. There was very strong networks and business skills in the ING Dream Starter Scholarship, lots of corporate connections, you, you know, so, so you look at the different, the, the different supports and pull in different things that you want. Thank you so much. Would you, um, Cameron, I'm hoping that you will share with us a little bit about what you found most important as you were growing up that supported your success as an adult in employment. Yeah, thanks so much, Karen. Um, <clears throat> I sort of categorise these into, into hard and soft skills. So obviously it's crucial that as a blind person that you have, you know, good computer, in my opinion, it's crucial that you have good computer skills, you know, good reading and writing skills, as it would be for any student. And in, in my case, that involved, you know, braille reading skills, um, as well as initially braille writing skills, but then um, touch typing as... Um, as, as I moved on to using a computer um, at school. But apart from those hard skills, I mean, obviously you need those, and it's, it's like Karen was saying, you need the, the maths, the science, the other um, skills, plus your specific um, disability-related skills. But the other ones that I thought were really crucial were the soft skills. So what I mean by that is, you think about it, your blindness can be an amazing asset that you've also got in the employment market. It's an asset that other people don't have. How many other people have people constantly coming up to them in the street and saying, um, oh, look, you know, um, or, or not so much in the street, but when you, know, you might meet people and they say, oh, you know, what can you see? And you explain to them, well, I can't see anything. And they go, oh, so is it just black? And you go, no, no, it's not black um, because I don't know what black is. And they go, oh. And then, and so all that explanation, it might seem like it's a bit tedious or it's a bit different, but they're all soft skills that over time you develop. And, and that's only one example. There's hundreds of others that you could rattle off. 
they're all soft skills that you can, in communication, in explanation, in clarification, that you can develop and that you can put to great use as an employee. The same, the other thing that I thought was fantastic for development of my soft skills was sport. Um, I played cricket um, at a representative level from quite a young age and it taught me the value of teamwork. It taught me the value of failure and success. Um, it would teach me the, the skills of cooperating, of working with other people, of motivating other people, of, um, of banding together to help your mate when things didn't go right. They're the sort of skills that then translate into fantastic on-the-job skills that can help you build a work team or work collaboratively with colleagues or to negotiate the way that you do your job with particular colleagues. So you might have a part of your job that's really tricky for you to do um, because of your site, but colleagues might be, you might observe that colleagues are hitting roadblocks as well that may not necessarily be site related, but which you can actually step in and help them with um, because of your skills and experience. And so rather than thinking, gee, I'm no good because I'm doing this job, um, I'm not able to do every single aspect of this job like my sighted counterparts do. Instead, just think, well, I'm doing fine. I'm just doing the job. I'm just doing the job differently, and I'm adding value in precisely the same ways, but possibly different areas. And so, all those soft skills feed into employment. So, in many ways, your blindness is an asset that other employees simply don't have. Kim, thank you so much. Before you pass that mic down, I want to ask Kim one specific question about what you find in a typical work day is your favorite thing and your least favorite thing. Okay. Um, it it kind of depends on the role. At the moment, I'm sub-dean at the ANU College of Law, which involves me. Um, I deal with both students and staff, and I manage um, the students that are sort of going off the tracks with their degree, and um, some of the policy-related aspects of of our job with the staff. The, probably the most enjoyable part is when you can, when you get a student who's going off the tracks with their degree and you can bring them in, sort out a, a plan for them moving forward and often that's more than just their studies. It can involve um, you know, giving them some, some techniques to get things back on track in their life more generally. Um, but, but your main aspect is of course their study program. You set out the plan for them and they, and they, they go off and they implement it. That's a really enjoyable part of my job. The least favourite part of my job is when I'm when I'm teaching and I have to mark student work, because <laughs> it is amazing how repetitive assignments can be. So that's definitely the the least enjoyable. It's, it's downright boring, isn't it, Cam? <laughs> Nikki, hang on. You tell us what same thing. What is your favourite part of the job, and your least favourite part of the job? My favourite part of the job is that I get to do something I'm really passionate about and that I absolutely love. And that is a huge privilege. Um, uh, it's, it's extremely hard, it's extremely difficult and it's very rewarding. And I guess in saying that, I'd just like to... Um, I'd just like to point out to all the teachers um, out there and, um, you know, other people who are assisting all these awesome young ones in the room, uh, not to underestimate, not to underestimate the privilege of being a sighted or able-bodied person when you're young and you're, you know, you're encouraged to dream, uh, you know, Every little boy and girl is, what do you want to be when you grow up, you know? What, um, and as an able-bodied person, you've always been able to pick whatever it is you want and think, wow, if I really apply myself to that, I could do it. And I, I, I think as we go forward into the future, we want to make sure that's the case for um, ch children with disability. And please know all you awesome young ones out there, that I couldn't agree with Cameron more in that your, um, your vision, uh, it, it's, or your vision impairment is, is an asset, not an impairment. Please think of, of what you have, what you've developed because you are vision impaired, are uh, awesome, um, mostly soft skills that 
are, you know, they are key leadership qualities and they are key qualities for innovation and we're constantly being told we need innovation in the future, innovation, innovation, innovation and, you know, great innovative leaders and the qualities that living with a disability can build, things like, I believe, living with a disability can make you um, innately inclusive in the way you think, um, it makes you resilient, it makes you good at problem solving, um, you know, all these, all, all the different <laughs> skills are awesome leadership skills and innovation skills. So please know, you, you've got something, you, you've got stuff going on there that your average CEO would give their PA's right arm for. Ian, what do you think? We know about the boiling stuff, but what, what, when you think on the day, what is the thing that you just think this is the best part? What's the best part? That's a really bad thing to ask a chef, okay? Um, it's definitely service time, finish, knock off. It's the best part of the day, all right? I'll be honest, but you know, the best part is really is, you know, I've taken a lot of people off the streets with disabilities or whatever, you know, in that way. And to see them excel at what they do and, and to be able to, you know, walk in a kitchen and know nothing, but when they walk out each afternoon, it's, it's they've achieved their day, they've done what they're supposed to do, they're proud of what they do, you know. One, one of our staff in particular is filling in for one of our chefs that's overseas at the moment. Um, and she came in very rough around the edges, shall I say. Um, but, you know, unbelievable. Her prep work this week has been, has excelled all expectations. And, you know, you can achieve anything you want if you put your mind to it, but you have to work at it, you know. And just with the mentoring thing and, and that, you know, I was part of the SBS program of um, the, uh, the, the employables. And, you know, the one thing that learns is, is what my other colleagues here say, it makes you more resilient, it makes you tougher, and you won't let go, but it doesn't jump out and grab you. You have to look for it. And when you do that, you'll be very happy. Thanks very much. Andrew, Tackle the Beast, favorite thing, least favorite thing about a typical day? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that I like about a typical day is that I don't really have a typical day. So the, the whole three job things means that, I mean, whilst I may have, you know, Wednesday and Thursday we had Vision Australia stuff for all of both days, but I was still doing stuff with the mediation bit, you know, when there was breaks, I was still planning my teaching on Friday. So the variety stuff I really like, but, but, but to not dodge the question entirely, um, I, I think by nature, um, I'm an anthropologist. I'm, real, I'm not trained as one, I'm trained with law and commerce degrees, but I'm really interested in human beings and, and teaching them is one aspect. Obviously, leading a board like Vision Australia's and working with the management, that's another lot of insight. And mediation is a, just an, an, a wild, joyful ride through everyone else's dysfunctional stuff. I mean, I mediate, I mediate commercial uh, disputes, you know, typically between big companies. And honestly, the more senior, the cleverer, the more highly paid people, the more um, weirdly dysfunctional is their conduct very often. And, um, you know, it's always very exciting. You know, you think, well, I'm going to hear one side of the story. I wonder what happened on the other side. Well, actually, people pay me to individually tell me each side. And I absolutely love that. I walk out and I, and I have to actually try and turn my brain off because I then get, you know, I walk out of the mediation eventually, I get on the tram and I'm simultaneously listening to 53 other stories trying to work out who's misunderstanding whom. Um, and I need that break. So that, I mean, I, I honestly, I can't begin to tell you what a, what a blast that is. Um, the bad bit, oh, well, on those days when I'm marking, I'm absolutely with Cam on this one, marking is awful, um, especially marking law students because they're all desperate to litigate against you if they don't like the result. Um, <laughs> But, but putting that one aside, um, no, to me, the, the, bad, the bad days, and they're ba they are bad days, is when I do all that stuff, for example, in mediation, and people still make a bad decision, and people still make a decision which is self-harming, that, you know, I've said, look, actually, you, you know, you, you risk, if you don't resolve this matter today, that in, you know, 
two years' time, you're standing on the steps of the Supreme Court, you know, bankrupt and what have you, and some people, despite all my efforts to try and help them break out of that cycle, you know what, they stand on the cliff and they just jump off without a parachute, and that's really tough, and, um, but th that's the nature of it. You, you, you can't win them all, um, and I have, to, uh, I have to pick myself up from that and do it again the next day, um, but I think every role has, has something like that. Or I think that, that watching people jump off the cliff is the hardest thing we do when we care about other people, and you obviously do, Andrew. So I'd like to kind of try to wrap things up, if you will, but to ask each of you to think for just a minute, and I'm going to put Andrew on the spot because he's holding the mic, and let him start it and just pass it back down that row. But what would you, if you could say anything... To the young people in this room, the parents in this room, the teachers in this room, what would be the two chunks of advice, tips, that you would give? I was um, going to try and, and hijack the mic, even if I didn't have this opportunity. Um, and I was going to say to Karen, as um, Karen knows, and Nat and Ron, I hate talking about my eyesight. My main coping strategy is ignoring it. So um, I was going to try and, and play on their sympathy to let me say um, just one thing, because I think this piece of observation I'm going to make is actually worth two. Um, I really want to, to make a, a very strong point here. Everything you've heard from Karen, everything you've, you've work through with your teachers um, in, in, the, in the blindness world and generally everything is really um, invaluable. Everything you're going to learn today about, um, about different jobs but there is one single defining thing that will I think matter more than anything else and this has got nothing to do with visual impairment whatsoever. This is driving everyone which is actually self-knowledge. Um, it doesn't, I mean, learning about other jobs and say, right, I'm going to find out about lots of jobs and pick one, that misses the fundamental point. You need to understand yourself, what makes you happy, what makes you fulfilled. If you, and, and, and one of the, you know, you can sit through a mil million psychometric tests and you might get an answer, but actually, if I can give a, a really quick tip, think about the things that you choose to do randomly, the, the hobbies you take, the discussion you have with your friends, the TV programs you watch, whatever it may be, when you're not sitting there thinking, I'm not planning my career, I'm not picking subjects at school, but what will I randomly do? And I can be quite confident, for example, if you are the person who um, invariably ends up, you know, organizing the parties, bossing the netball team, whatever, the chances are you probably don't want to have a career as a librarian, okay? Nothing about nothing against librarians, but if you choose when you have an opportunity to kind of mobilize, communicate, and organize a group of people, the chances are that there's something fundamentally in you that needs that for you to be happy. And, um, and therefore, my hot tip would be, when you're going to wander around talking with people that don't understand jobs, what would be the kind of job that would give me that kind of ability to make myself happy? Conversely, um, if your focus that you have chosen is memorizing statistics and categorization of World War II fighter planes, and that is the thing that really likes, you might be an awesome librarian, and I would try and find somebody who can fill you up on those things. So, so look at what you do in an unforced, unthoughtful way. Use that as an idea of maybe your fundamental drivers. Supplement it with uh, whatever um, uh, modern technology there is to, to do those things. And the single most important thing, apart from everything else, I mean, you still need all of the academic stuff and the, uh, the soft and hard skills and the blindness skills and all of those things that Karen and everyone else has articulated. But the single most important thing you can bring is an understanding of yourself. That's my one tip. Thank you. Wow. A tip. <laughs> you get to follow Andrew. <laughs> can we change microphones? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question for me. Um, look, single advice from, from the way I've done it and the only way it was available is, as I've said before, is you need to go out and look for what you want. Um, it, won't, it won't bite you on the ear and you won't get it for nothing. Um, I knocked on a lot of hard doors. Uh, everybody wants to help, but nobody really wants to help. It's, it's, it's hard, but it's not that hard if you want to put your, your effort into it and search out what you want. I mean, you know, anyone here today who wants to talk about 
being a chef or hospitality, I'm more than happy and I'm, and I'm there for, you, you know, for your uh, information if you want. Um, but, you know, search out what you want and, put, and go for it. There's nothing stopping you and, and only your own mind stops you because you can achieve anything if you want to. Thank you. And I think there's a theme happening here because that was very similar. That was kind of still along the lines of what Andrew said and I couldn't agree more with what Andrew said. Um, there was I just, yeah, about that self-awareness and please think um, uh, about how you can be what you want to be um, rather than what others want you to be. And now this is something, this is something that I was probably told as a teenage too, but um, I wasn't vision impaired as a teenager. I lost my vision later in life. So it's different when you um, are living with vision impairment. And just um, even listening to all the things that Karen was saying before, which of course are unbelievably important and relevant to um, not just all of you in the room, but people who are fully sighted. Um, there's so much of, um, of of needing, you know, you need to know what the employer wants. What does the employer want? What do they need you to be? What do they want you to be? How, how do you fit in? What do you got to do? And, and, of course, everyone in society, that you know, you, you do have to do that. And I noticed the presumption was that the employer was not only fully sighted, able-bodied, but a man... Um, <laughs> Sadly, that's highly, highly likely. You, you, you know, statistically, that's really likely. Um, but please, 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 um, it, it's quite overwhelming. It's quite daunting thinking, Jesus, who's going to give me a job? Who's going to give me a job? And I want a job that I love. I want to, you know, I want something that's fulfilling. Um, you know, how do I get these people to want me? Please, really put yourself first. Please think, how do I, you, you know, how do I be what I want to be? And um, how do I avoid what feels toxic? And how do I go towards what feels uplifting and fulfilling? And the other piece of advice I'd like to give is, um, you, you know, be, try, try and be um, fierce about facing failure. I can't remember exactly who it was, but last year on the panel, for the very first one of these last year, one of the um, gentlemen said that failure is just an outcome that you weren't expecting. And I love that, because I'm a big fan of failure anyway. You have to be as an entrepreneur. Um, but, you know, it's just an outcome that you weren't expecting, and you guys have more tools than most in innovating around that, and not just for yourselves, but for your work colleagues, for your workplace, for society. Um, well, <clears throat> I'd, I'd, in addition to all the other bits of advice, which have been excellent, I'd say to you, be prepared to think outside the box and not to follow necessarily the traditional path. So I'll give you an example. I um, transitioned from a career in insurance to a legal career. So when I finished my law degree, I didn't get a job in a law firm with clerkships. I got a job in an insurance company. But I knew I wanted to work in a law firm. Um, I knew that if I sent off thousands of emails, they would just end up in the same pile with the, the other thousands of emails that everybody else sends off. So I thought, right, how am I going to tackle this? And instead of writing to the firms that were in the area that I wanted to work in, I actually went online and looked up who were the key law firm partners who did the sort of work that I wanted to do. And then I didn't write to them because I knew it would get stuck in the HR department or their secretary's inbox. So instead I called, I phoned them up and I'd get through to the secretary and um, I'd say, could I speak to Mr. So-and-so please? Unfortunately, it was almost all Mr. So-and-so. But I'd, I'd say, look, can I, can I speak to them? And um, they'd say, oh, yes, um, does he know what it's in relation to? And I'd say, oh, yes, he does. And he, he wouldn't. And I'd, I'd get through, and, or I'd get through, and I'd, and I'd say to them, look, um, this, this is who I am. I'm, I'm really interested in employment law. And I'd, I, I never asked any of them for a job. 
I said I'd be really grateful if you could please give me a, a little bit of your time to give me some mentoring as to how I might be able to break into this field. Um, and it would be great if you could make some time to meet me for a coffee. Um, and most of them said yes. A couple of them said, I don't have any jobs. And I said, no, that's fine. I'm actually not looking for one. I'm just looking for some advice. And would you mind meeting me to give me some advice? Almost nobody can say no to giving advice. And then when you turn up, bring your resume and, <laughs> and, 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 and talk to them and sell yourself. And then by the end of it, I, I had three jobs by the end of it. So I think that's an example of where you can approach it in, a, in, a, in an innovative way. Um, it's, it's fairly labour intensive, but don't, be put, don't ever write to a HR department or a secretary. Go straight to the decision maker. And if you're in any doubt, it, just fob your way through it. Um, do they know what it is? Oh, yes, of course. And then there were many times when um, they'd say, oh, he's not in, and I'd say, oh, look, I'll, um, can you tell me when he'll be back? I'll call back at that point and they said can I take a message and I said oh, I'll be I'll be in and out can I call back at such and such a and so eventually I think it just got to the point where they were like oh god can you take this person's call they're just constantly <laughs> bugging me and then um, once you're through you know occasionally I'd have the odd one that would say oh I'm really sorry but I'm just a bit confused I don't actually know who you are uh, have have we met and I'd say oh look we haven't but but I, I'm so familiar with your work I feel like we have you know and and you can get through we would call that schmoozing. <laughs> and actually, I, I'm going to take this last two minutes to say what I want to say to you, which is that Cameron, Cam, has just given you the perfect example of what we call in career counseling informational interviewing. Informational interviewing is where you do exactly what he's just described you go out there and get what you want. You go to the top of the heap, you tell the person what it is you need once you have them in your hot little hands. I loved your approach. I think the idea of going through to the top is exactly what you need to do. If you don't have that opportunity, do what he did. Do your research online. Find out information about the folks that are working at that company where you want to leverage your skills. And go to an event. Find out what they do. Go to the event. Mix and mingle. Meet them. And let them know what it is you have to offer. I think this notion that you heard from Cam about informational interviewing and what you heard from each and every one of these panelists is that you have to go for it. You have to go for it. And the it is what you want to do, what you believe in, what is going to make you happy, and what you will be able to excel at doing. So I would encourage you to go for it as subtly as you have to, or as covertly as you have to, but define what it is you want, and then go after it. Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Three navy blue linked ovals form capital letters V and A within a bright yellow rectangle.